This question asks us to write as a single trig ratio, then evaluate. I just have a question. Yes. I just have a question. One more just finished. You did say both two theta equals in uh, quadrant three? No, two theta is in quadrant three because cos two theta and sine two theta are both linear. Oh, yeah, okay, that makes sense. The frustrating thing about the example that they have chosen here is that evaluating these could be done right away. Do you know pi over 4 from your pi plane? It's root 2 over 2. So cos of pi over 4 would be root 2 over 2. So cos squared of pi over 4 would be root 2 over 2 squared. Same thing with sine of pi over 4. Squared would be root 2 over 2 squared. So if you had root 2 over 2 squared minus root 2 over 2 squared, can you see that in A, the answer is going to be zero? Okay, but we're not following the instructions because the instructions say to first write it as a single trig ratio, then evaluate. We just evaluate. Okay, in fact, if you were given this one to evaluate, I hope that you would do it directly just like that. But since we have to first write it as a single trig ratio, well, we have to recognize this as an identity. There is a cos squared alpha minus sine squared alpha on your formula sheet. It is equal to cos 2 alpha. So on your formula sheet, you have this. Is it alpha on your formula sheet? I think it is. Textbook, yeah, on the formula sheet, they choose alpha. Formula, I think it's textbook had theta. So now I'm going to get cos of 2. And then my alpha was pi over 4 is 2 times pi over 4. And the 2 is really 2 over 1. How do you multiply fractions? Multiply the tops, multiply the bottom, simplify. Can you see that this is going to equal cos of pi over 2? Which is also on your unit circle. Right at the top, what's your x coordinate? It's 0, which is what we had hoped, because we already figured that out. But this would be writing it as a single trig function first, and then evaluate it. B. Okay. Cool. I have a whole bunch of tangents in a fraction. I should look at my formula sheet. Is there any whole bunch of tangents in a fraction? Yes, it happens in three places. The tan alpha plus beta have a whole bunch of tangents in fractions, and the tan two alpha has a whole bunch of tangents in fractions. This looks similar or identical to the tan 2 alpha one. So I'm going to write it out. 2 tan alpha over 1 minus tan squared alpha. Does it match up perfectly? Not quite. Not quite. Not quite means you're not allowed to use it. Unless you can make it match up perfectly. What's wrong? Do you see on this, the actual formula has 1 minus, and this one has something minus 1. Bruh. Okay, so what are we going to do? We are going to be strategic and factor a negative 1 out of the bottom. In fact, I'm just going to write it as a negative. I'm going to factor a negative out of the bottom. If I take a negative out of the bottom, do you see that the 1 will become positive? And the tan squared then would become negative. And now I need to know properties of negatives in fractions. And I'll do it just with regular numbers. When I show you with regular numbers, you'll probably agree. If I took a fraction like 2 over negative 3, would you agree that that's the same as negative 2 over positive 3? Or it's the same as just putting that negative out in front as negative 2 thirds. When we have a negative in the fraction, we can decide where we want that negative to be. It could be in the numerator, the denominator, or it could be out in front. It means the same thing. That's important in our situation right now because I have a negative on the bottom of my fraction. If I put that negative in front of that fraction, nice. 
now in the brackets matches up perfectly with that black formula. You see that now with the brackets? Matches up perfectly. So I can change this to negative, and instead of this bracket, I can write 10 of 2 times pi over 6, which is negative 10 of pi over 3. On your pi plate, and we get negative root 3. Yes? I do not understand the first specific step. From here to here? Yeah. Okay. That's good. Enough. We're going to actually I'll you zoom out so you can see the entire page. To go from this step to this step, you are going to use. The formula. The formula says if you have the right hand oh, side, yeah, yeah, yeah. it matches up perfectly, I can change it to the left hand side. So that's how these identities are powerful. You can take the right hand side anytime you want and change it to the left hand side. Or you can take the left hand side anytime you want and change it to the right hand side. You could get yourself stuck in a proof just flipping back and forth forever. It would never be wrong. You just wouldn't get anywhere because you just do a step then undo a step. Oh, I felt so bad once I had a grade 10 student where the question said factor. You know, you guys are good at factoring. So they factored it. And as soon as they had two brackets beside each other, they're like, ooh, if I have two brackets, I have to foil. So they foiled it out. And then they got a trinomial. And they're like, oh, I can factor this. And they factored it. And they're like, oh, I've got two sets of brackets. And they multiplied it out again. Eventually, they made a mental math mistake and had to end their question with, this can't be factored. It's like, so sad. Right? So we have to realize that they're just going in circles. You can do that with identities. You can switch back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. But there should be a purpose, right? In this case, um, with your identity formula, the alpha plus beta one and the double angle ones, generally we consider the left side to be like simplified and the right side to be expanded. And usually the right side has more stuff and the left side has less stuff. But we're going to find out sometimes we want to change the right hand side to the left hand side, and sometimes the left hand side to the right hand side. For proofs, we will almost always try to get rid of the double angle to go into normal stuff, because that's how we do our proofs. Solving questions, sometimes the mix of both. Sometimes you can switch it and solve it like a multi-revolution question, and sometimes you can switch out of it and solve it like a regular question. So it's going to go both ways. All right, I'm going to add a C and a D to this one, just for fun. But this time we are just going to evaluate. Because I said in those first examples, <coughs> we haven't finished yet. I'm adding C and D, and then I'll tell you which question. So in C, I would like you to evaluate 1 minus without a calculator, your first ever pi over 8 question. Pi over 8 is not on your formula sheet. Bum, bum. No, they're not on your pie plate. You have no good point. But this is one of your formulas, right? Because if you look at your formula sheet, you have that cos 2 alpha equals 1 minus 2 sine squared alpha. This matches up perfectly. That means you are allowed to change it to cos 2. And what was the alpha? Pi over 8. Why is that helpful? you can make that pi over 4. 
And that is on your pie plate. You can get root to them over two. How tricky do you want me to make these? Like, just regular or regular with the skin? Regular with the skin. Oh, you just regular. If I tell you you're just regular, then the regular with the twist is kind of giving it. Regular is fine. Okay. Regular is going to look like this is the twist. This is the twist. This is regular. Just adding that two out in front makes it terribly so much easier. Taking that two away makes it trickier. Those are 12s. They look like R's. I have four. Those are twelve. Now, this on a test or on the exam often shows up as a two mark question. I even see it sometimes as a one mark question on the exam, but usually it's a two mark. The danger that students have with this question is, you know how yesterday we did a bunch of pi over 12 questions? You see the pi over 12, your gut instinct might be, ooh, I know how to do pi over 12 questions and do them. A single pi over 12 question on an exam is usually three or four marks. This would be two of them, plus the mental math of combining them. So if you did this as a pi over 12 question, it should be worth seven or eight marks on a test. And yet, it's only worth two marks. Because they want you to recognize this is one of our formulas. That sine 2 alpha is 2 sine alpha cos alpha, which would allow me to change this to sine 2 and alpha is pi over 12, which reduces sine of pi over 6, which is 1. If the 2 wasn't there, you know what I would do? I would put it there and take it away. Sneaky, eh? And then this part would go to here, but then there would still be a half out in front, and a half out in front, and then your final answer would be one quarter. That's how it would be. But it's what makes it trickier is now the formula doesn't show up exactly as you see it, so you're more tempted to do it as a pi over 12 question. This is still a lot easier. So we can put up when the identity squid is three to two, because today is Tuesday. Two days from now will be Thursday. So that is, is it 7.5 to 7.6? I think so, yeah. Yes. The one you just got. Okay. I think it's six to seven. So that will be due on Thursday. And there is a pre-quiz. Online for that as well. The quiz has made everyone scared that they had to cut the big things earlier on. And my next question is Did this make it around to everyone? And where did the paper then go? Is it at the back? Yeah, it is. Questions for practice on these ones, four, five, and six. 